In this video, you will learn about the weekly and semi-supervised method of artificial-based image analysis for digital pathology. Hi, I'm Alexandra Zhurev and I'm here to help you do better digital pathology and tissue image analysis. So if you're interested in getting involved or you are already doing this and want to learn more, this place is for you. So be sure to subscribe and click the bell below to be notified every time I release a new video. I'm a pathologist, so to explain the computer vision concepts of semi-supervised and weekly supervised methods for digital pathology, I invited an expert. Today, my guest is Gert Lietjens. He is the member of the Computational Pathology Group at the Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. He is an author of many publications on this subject, co-organizer of the Chameleon 16 and Chameleon 17 Image Analysis Challenge, and a renowned expert in computer vision for digital pathology. No. The video is long and goes into great detail of the supervised and weekly supervised methods, especially for somebody without computer vision background. But if you're interested in this area, it's definitely worth sticking around and listening till the end. Today, my guest is Gert Lietjens, and he is the member of the Computational Pathology Group at Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Hi, Gert. How are you? Hi, Alexandra. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're going to be talking, as you see on the slides, about weekly and unsupervised learning in computational pathology. And I have some understanding of this, but what I have seen across the industry, especially on the side of non-computer scientists, is that this is perceived as some new magical tri trick that... Um, computer vision is now able to do and maybe we don't have to do annotations anymore and we can just use this weekly or unsupervised learning and take the deep learning and pathology to the next level. So I invited her to talk to us about it and to talk about the potential of this method and also about the limitations. Yes, so I'll go ahead. I have a presentation prepared. And uh, I think Alexander will interrupt me when there are any uh, any questions. I will be interrupting you uh, a lot because I will okay. be asking questions. Very good. Okay, I'll just get started. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction again. And well, I'll just very briefly just go over um, some very basic applications of computational pathology that I think by now everybody who's listening to this podcast knows. So. Um, for example, as a, a common task uh, or a task that uh, a lot of people have worked on in the past is the detection of metastases of cancer in lymph nodes on the clinical side. And this is pretty challenging because these metastases can be very small. And um, we've shown in the past that using supervised learning, so fully supervised learning with detailed pixel level annotations, as you can see here on the left, um, you're able to uh, solve this problem pretty well. And the way you generally do it, or as traditionally do it, is you just take um, you just take patches of normal tissue, patches of abnormal tissue. You feed that to your deep convolutional neural network, and obviously these patches are based on detailed annotations by a pathologist. And then you can train a deep learning system, a convolutional neural network, to express or learn what is tumor and what is not tumor. And then you can apply that to a whole slide image and you get a sort of resultant likelihood map or segmentation, whatever you want. And for lymph node metastases, for example, if you have fully annotated slides, that works pretty well uh, for small metastases, but also for large ones. And in many cases now, so for lymph node metastases, but also for other applications, uh, it has been shown that these types of deep learning convolutional neural networks can outperform pathologists if it's for used for the chameleon challenge and i just want to mention that your yeah. group was a co-author and co-organizer of this challenge right yeah so we were for the chameleon challenges we were the main organizers but we didn't have the best algorithm so the best algorithm uh -huh. was for... <laughs> so you didn't win Good. we didn't that win be... we did organize it you know, but we didn't win <laughs> No, so I mean, the, not good that you didn't, but it would be suspicious if you would. 
Yes. So luckily there were people better than us. So this, uh, <laughs> this um, group from uh, Harvard Medical School and MIT uh, in the end won the challenge and they later started a company that might be familiar to many of the listeners, uh, Path AI. So here we do annotations uh, of the um, epithelial cells in the lymph node and we yep. can train the network to detect it. Yes, exactly. So I think this is pretty traditional, what most people uh, know from computational pathology. And is also something that uh, pathologists might not like so much because annotating these cells in detail is just a, yeah, it's a massive amount of work. Um, of course, there are tricks that you can do to work around this. So we've done this for mitotic counting, uh, where you just use immunistic chemistry as a sort of surrogate reference standard, but you cannot do that for every task and yeah it's it's more expensive you need to go back to your tissue blocks you have to restain you have to register so also a lot of other complications that uh, that come up but there's an alternative already to pathologist based annotations but still this is fully supervised learning where you need to annotate uh, everything only here the human burden is a bit less Mm -hmm. I like this way of annotating because it's a lot more objective. You have a different method, a molecular method that's doing this and not a human observer. And you kind of eliminate the human differences, the inter-observer variability in annotation. Yeah. Yeah. And especially for tasks like uh, mitotic counting, but also for uh, tumor grading, where well, for the latter one, uh, there's no generally no molecular stain, but yeah, it helps making your reference standard a bit more objective and also your training data a bit more objective. But yeah, like I said, that's also not possible for every single task. For example, if you want to predict patient survival from your slide or maybe some form of genetic mutation, generally you cannot annotate that. And often there's also not an antibody you can use to highlight mm -hmm. these regions in the slide. So this is where uh, other types of learning come in. So we've discussed supervised learning and I'll first just briefly go into weekly supervised learning. So just to maybe sketch a bit the difference between computer vision and computational pathology. So in computer vision, generally the images they work with are in the order of magnitude of a couple of hundred pixels times a couple of hundred pixels, and maybe at the most like a thousand times a thousand. Um, and that means that you can just, regardless of the content in the image, just train end-to-end -end convolutional neural networks. So you don't generally need pixel level annotations for classification tasks. So you basically feed the whole image if it's just a natural image. Yeah, if it's just a natural image, you tend to just feed the entire image. And as everybody in computational pathology knows, for a slide, that's not so easy. A typical slide consists of more than 10 billion pixels. And just to put it in context with computer, common computer vision data sets, so one single slide is already one-tenth of the ImageNet challenge. So, and the ImageNet challenge is a million images. So just to give a bit of scale comparisons. I love this comparison. <laughs> Yeah. I love taking this because, every, like you said, everybody knows they're big. Like, how big are they? I usually give the comparison, okay, one image can be like a two-hour HD movie. But exactly. this also in the computer vision context, it's already one-tenth of ImageNet. And ImageNet is supposed to be like this massive database of images. So. Yeah, exactly. So the thing is that with the images that we're working with in computational pathology, putting an entire image naively into a deep convolutional network is impossible. Even if you would have the fastest supercomputer on the planet, it still would be completely infeasible to do that. So, so Eric, people... question here. Yeah. Do you see it being possible any time in the future? Or like what would have to happen for this to be possible? Yeah, so you see that... Um, certain aspects of computation are still growing close to exponentially. So for example, we're still doubling the amount of computer memory every X years. Uh, we still manage to get bigger and bigger hard drives and SSDs. So I will not say that it's not going to be feasible uh, ever, uh, but it's still going to take quite some time, uh, multiple decades probably, before you can run actual experiments with whole slide images naively. And then the additional question is still, is that then the most efficient way to do it? Just brute forcing the solution or can you also come up 
with a smart way of doing this. And I think uh, several groups have already shown that this is also feasible without uh, having uh, the supercomputer from the future. So just to sketch that a bit, so we've also already discussed the, the annotation of, uh, of pixels. So generally uh, for tasks where you have slight level labels, for example, patient uh, survival and something that you want to predict, you cannot even make these annotations, but even if you could, they're time consuming, there's disagreement, all these things we've already discussed. And another issue that people tend not to realize uh, when they naively work on that problem is that a neural network then also only sees patches. So they have no clue about the global context. So where is this patch in the tissue? Um, is there so some coherent? Okay. Yeah. A question here. This is true for the supervised as well, right? Even if we annotate the full slide, the network only learns fragments. Exactly. Yes. So if you uh, train a patch-based network, so based on tiles from the image, you know that the network can never put or learn the context of this patch. So for example, in the lymph nodes, the anatomical structure of a lymph node is completely unknown to the network and also cannot leverage this knowledge to make better predictions. And that's where you, for example, sometimes see stupid false positives that a pathologist can easily discard because they know, okay, this group of epithelial cells is probably just a fragment that is appearing there because of surgical uh, artifacts instead of being an actual metastasis. And if you would have global context, a neural network could also learn that. But that's also true for supervised learning. If you only have patches, that's something you cannot learn. Mm -hmm. So then even if you have like perfect annotations of everything, uh, there is a limitation because you cannot see the context. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I think um, uh, this is often uh, forgotten and the method to improve is like more annotations, better annotations, more annotations. At some point there is no improvement anymore. And I guess this is one of the reasons why this is happening. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons, um, of course, there are tasks uh, for example, the lymph node metastasis detection that you can solve for a large part locally. So you don't need a global context for many of the, the questions you can ans ask. But there's also other things. So you have the global context of the slide, but for example, also uh, patient information, uh, things like age, history, outcome of blood-based tests, all that kind of stuff. That's not... A do a, a physicians, pathologists can use this information to come up with a better diagnosis, and this is still very uncommon in, um, in computational pathology. So we're not yet using this multimodality of information? Not really. So there are some research papers out there that look at that, but I don't think there's like a consensus way of incorporating this information. Okay, so for weekly supervised learning, so this is a very famous paper from the group that later formed uh, the company Page, probably also very well known to the uh, listeners of this podcast, paper from Campanella at All Nature Medicine 2019. And I think this was the first uh, large scale application of weekly supervised learning to histopathology images that actually had very competitive results to supervised learning. So people have tried these types of algorithms before, but I think this was the first time that these results were really competitive with fully supervised learning. And speaking of different spin-off companies, do you guys, does your group already have a spin-off company? Yes. Since last year, we also have a spin-off company. So thank you for allowing me to advertise it. Of course, <laughs> go ahead. That's no, what so we are um, for. Uh, we, our group late last year spun out our uh, startup, Eosin. Um, and they've gotten some nice initial seed investments and they're now working hard. So a couple of my former PhD students, together with Jeroen van der Laak, a scientific advisor and the experienced CEO, Patrick de Boer, are now trying to uh, put all these algorithms, all this stuff we developed over the past 20 years uh, to actual use, uh, both in clinical practice and in uh, research settings. So uh, Fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to give you, you know, a couple of months to... Uh, accelerate a little bit and maybe we're going to meet again to talk about the company. Yeah, sure. That would be nice. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that on spinoff companies. Um, so and the I will link, link to your website in the show notes. <laughs> yes, I will. Um, 
So what they did in the Nature Medicine paper was actually not that complicated uh, from a methodological perspective. So they still took a patch-based approach. They essentially divided the entire slide into patches and put all these patches through a convolutional neural network. So very simple patch-based classifier. But then they said, okay, the patch that has the highest probability of containing cancer, that's the patch that we consider representative for the entire slide. So in the end, um, they still classify the entire slide based on patches, but they only take the top one patch uh, as the slide level prediction. And well, naively, you lose a lot of information, right? Because in the end, you're only lo losing one patch per tile, but they solve that by just using tens of thousands of slides. And then when you do that, then you still have tens of thousands of images, so patches in their case, uh, and you can still get very competitive results to uh, settings where you would completely manually annotate all the individual tumor nests. And that was a bit of a wake up call, I think, to the community that these types of methods are actually feasible as long as your data set is large enough. Mm -hmm. I think this is, um, I guess you're going to have uh, more advanced methods still, but I think this was the moment where it was, oh, if you have a lot of data, then uh, you don't need to annotate so much. So there was like this camp of, oh, you have to have a lot of annotations. And then it was like, just throw so many images, as many as you can, and then it's going to be good enough as well. Yeah, yeah. So I will get into a bit more advanced methods. It's important to realize that the tasks they uh, worked on in this paper are also tasks that with supervised learning, so fully supervised learning, I think you can solve with tens, maybe hundreds of slides. So you, the, the difference in scale that you need to actually make this method as they implemented it work is like a factor, two orders of magnitude more slides you need to make this work. Oh, okay. So, so <laughs> you either sit there for hours and annotate or you gather like, a lot of slides and don't annotate. Hmm, which is exactly. But yeah, it's but not question, always easy to get. One question before we move. So yeah. they they chose this uh, um, this tile, this patch of highest probability. How do you know? How does the network decide that this is the highest probability? If yeah, so it's in, only weekly supervised, it's just a label that there is cancer, right? How yeah. So you leverage the the knowledge that in slides that have a negative label so that don't contain cancer there you're 100 percent sure that every single patch should be normal so for those actually without annotations you already have the correct labels so for the slides with cancer there there is the question okay which patches within that slide actually show cancerous cells so when you start learning the network will be pretty bad at that but then you, uh, as, as with other patch-based networks, so you can just say, okay, uh, I know that in the normal cases, everything should be normal. So I can, can learn the normal essentially. And then slowly you learn what is abnormal. So you iteratively get better at identifying the abnormal uh, patches. And then so after a bit of training, you can actually use, you you get reasonably good at finding the cancerous patches in the cases with cancer. And then you also start leveraging those in your learning process and you get a better and better understanding of what is cancerous as well. So that's, I think the key that maybe some people don't realize the fact that this works is also because for the slides that don't have cancer in their application, you actually know 100% that all the patches are normal. That you're correct in your label. Yeah, I think that's uh, maybe often missed because from the supervised learning, you're so focused on the lesion, on the change that you're yeah. annotating that you kind of apply the same type of thinking to anything else. And here, like you say, whatever is non-cancer is 100% accurate. Yeah, essentially all the non-cancerous slides are still fully annotated. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the, the advantage that you're levering with, with this method. Um, but yeah, like I said, it is a bit of a naive method in the sense that you're reducing every slide, which has a lot of information, to one patch. And that's not a very efficient use of data. And if you go to more complicated problems, then cancer, yes, no. 
uh, it becomes more challenging to find enough slides to make this method work. And you will actually need to leverage all the information you have in the in the slides you can uh, collect. Okay, so I'll just move on to uh, another strategy. Uh, this was developed in our group and then later developed by other groups. Um, but the idea here is that you actually decouple the classification and the feature extraction process. So the way this works is that you still uh, consider patches from a whole slide image, as you can see here. So you extract all the patches from the whole slide image, but you use a pre-trained uh, deep neural network. And how did, you can do this pre-training in, in several ways. Of, I'm not going into too much detail, but for every patch, um, you can then extract a feature vector, which is much smaller uh, than the original patch in terms of memory. And then you can stack these feature vectors together such that they form again the original image spatially. And then you can train a classification network on this much reduced representation. So essentially, mm -hmm. this is a compressed version of the original image. And then you can train this part for whatever task you want. And then you can actually leverage the entire image and you're no longer restricted to the information that is located in a patch. So, so okay, so you're reducing the dimensionality of the image, but increasing the amount of context that you work with. Yeah, so the amount of features extracted uh, from each patch, that is what you still use. Mm -hmm. uh, and this feature extraction and this actual, the end-to-end the -end classification. So here we feed in the entire image into a deep neural network, because, but because this image is compressed, uh, that mm -hmm. actually works uh, or fits. The disadvantage is that this, these two steps are disconnected. So you need this... Uh, compression part, this encoder network to actually extract relevant features from the patches for your final task, because you're not training this in one go. You're first extracting the features and then training a network to do whole slide image classification. So tell me if I'm wrong or not. So this to me looks like a 3D convolution, like this kernel that you have on a 2D image that goes and extracts the um, like the average of the kernel, the, the, the pixels around here, you have this like in a 3d structure where you can stack multiple, um, feature, feature vectors. Did, did you call them feature vectors? Yeah, I did. Feature vectors together, right? Yeah. So essentially pathology, <laughs> images, pathology images are in some sense already 3d because they're, they have three dimensions. The with the height and the color dimension, but this color dimension is only three samples large. And in um, these types of convolutional neural networks, you actually reduce the spatial size. So you reduce the width and the height. So you can see here that these feature vectors have a width of one pixel and the height of one pixel, but you increase the, the feature dimension. So this color dimension is, in, is increased. So it, it's sort of, you make it more 3D. You can see it like that. Okay. So you actually okay. compress the context into the the depth, so to say. And this is going to be on YouTube. So whoever is listening and wants a visual, go ahead and click on the YouTube link, um, mm -hmm. because then maybe it's going to be easier to understand. Yeah. Yeah. So also don't want to spend too much time, but uh, there was actually a group from Harvard, from Faisal Mahmoud's group, who actually expanded this approach and they combined it with uh, an attention mechanism maybe too long to get into too much detail but the but let's 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 mention this attention because this is another like new buzzword at some that came into the yeah. game at some point at least to me um as somebody from outside of the computer vision uh, community, there was this attention. And at some point, attention was everything. Where is it yep. extracting this information? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So an issue is here is that you use the entire image, but not the entire image is relevant to the question you're trying to answer. For example, this background is not interesting if you want to see if metastases are there or not. And this network has essentially no way of saying, okay, this area is important and this area is not important. And that complicates classification. So what the authors in this paper did was they added an attention mechanism. And what an attention mechanism does is it essentially looks 
at the features coming from each patch. And based on these features determines whether this patch is important for classification or not. And the way it does that is it gives it a value between zero and one, where zero is not important at all. And one is very important. And that way you can actually only use parts of the image, the parts that are relevant. And this attention mechanism is also trained. So it is essentially learning what to look at. Very similar, I would say, to a pathologist. So when a pathologist makes a diagnostic decision based on a whole slide, they're not using the entire slide to make that decision. They're using very specific parts of that slide to make that decision. And essentially this network was the first to integrate that into... Um, How into is it happening? How can you like train an attention mechanism? <laughs> Yeah, so you start essentially by just saying, okay, everything is important. And then over time, you learn in a date, like you learn what is in a patch is important to come up with your classification. You also learn which patches are important for your classification. So it's the same learning mechanism. It's just a different way of looking at the problem. So here you just say, okay, I want to know which features in these patches are relevant for my classification. And this attention backbone is what they call it here, determines, okay, which of these patches, which of these parts of the image is important. And the advantage is if you do that, you can actually visualize this attention as well. So these are some nice examples of that, I think. Um, so. Here you see in red is high attention. So what the neural network thinks is important for the diagnostic decision. And blue is low attention. So what is less important for the diagnostic decision? And you can see they put some nice, I think it's a cytokeratin marker where you can correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong. Yeah, cytokeratin, yeah. Yeah. So you can see that this attention aligns very well with actually the cytokeratin thin marker. So the network has indeed learned which areas of the image are actually relevant uh, for the prediction. And even if you look at high resolution, this still matches very nicely. So a question, is this uh, a step in the direction of explainable AI that is now another buzzword or another important concept? Basically those buzzwords are end up being important concepts, especially yep. in healthcare. Yes, partly so. Uh, so in this case, I think it's uh, pretty clear that attention is also helpful in identifying the important areas in the image. And these areas also correspond to things we know that are important. But we should be careful in terms of if the tasks are a little bit more complicated. For example, uh, let's say the marker prediction. Yeah, molecular marker prediction. Then sometimes attention can also be confusing. So the neural network is pay attention, attention to regions that a pathologist would think, I have no clue, there is nothing relevant there. And then you have to be careful that you don't explain the attention map uh, yourself, because then the network is not explainable, but you are explaining what you think the network is doing. So then you are explainable, but not the network. Too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, it's, it's a bit the same. So as with uh, other explainability techniques, if it's just visual, then it's still the person looking at the image who interprets what he is seeing, he or she is seeing. And this can be correct or not correct. And in this case, I think it's easy to interpret, but this can also be very hard. Mm -hmm. But One here also, again, you have this uh, molecular marker, the IHC marker that is kind of a, a objective ground truth. Yes, it's not exactly. just it just happens to be easily uh, distinguishable visually. If it was a lymph, um, uh, if it was an immune cell marker, there is no way of distinguishing this visually. But you no. still have a, a ground truth, assuming antibodies work and everything works in the lab. Yes, that all, that's also not all, always the case. <laughs> that in, indeed. <laughs> Um, but one important thing to note is that this network also still has a separate feature extraction step. So this part and the second part is also still separate. So it's not trained 
end-to-end. -end. So the features are learned separately from the rest of the network. And that can be, so maybe just summarizing, they actually compared this approach to the pro approach from Campanella et al. That was in Nature Medicine. So, so this very... approach is called, uh, what's the this approach called? CLAM. And this stands for? Clustering Constraint Attention Multiple Instance Learning. So it's also multiple instance learning, but it has attention and it has clustering. Whereas I think the clustering is not so important, but the attention part is very important. Um, and what you can see, and that's what I explained previously, is uh, so what they have here is a couple of different tasks and they compare to the method from Campanella. So the method from Page, they compare their method to. And what you see is that if you have lots and lots of data, then they're roughly equivalent. CLAM is still generally a bit better, but CLAM can handle much fewer data samples. So here they have the percentage of the training set essentially. So with only 10% of the training set, CLAM already has pretty good results and uh, MIL is much less efficient. So that's already where you see that in the Campanella paper, you really needed tens of thousands of slides to make it work. And now we are already using more sophisticated methods. You see that the data requirements of this weekly supervised learning are getting much lower. So question, how does this compare to the data needed for fully supervised and annotations? Is it comparable or we still can get away with less data if we annotate fully? You can still get away with less data. So in general... Shoot, we have to keep annotating. <laughs> Uh, it, it depends. So there are tasks for which you cannot annotate. So that that those are uh, anyway excluded. There are tasks where you actually want a detailed segmentation. Um, so that you cannot do with these types of weekly supervised approaches. So the attention maps is sort of a surrogate segmentation, but generally not accurate enough to be a real segmentation. So there are still many tasks for which we still need to do annotations. But I think for classification, um, we're getting quite close to not needing them anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, it, very quickly summarizing um, the methods I discussed up till now. So we had the patch-based classification where you needed fully supervised or you, you needed supervised annotation. Uh, like I said, you don't have context. So that's a problem. Yeah, data efficient is not completely fair to discuss because you need annotations for it. So it, anyway, it's not very... Uh, time efficient, so let's put it like that. Yeah, you have to train the network and you cannot use the slide level label in a patch-based classifier. So you need the, the, the annotations. So multiple instance learning as presented by Campanella at all, you still don't have global context because you're still doing a patch classification. It's very inefficient. So you need tens of thousands of slides. The rest, you can use the whole slide level label. So you don't need pixel level annotation. So that's a big advantage. Uh, and for the last two methods that I showed, so the CLAM and neural image compression, you actually do have some global context because with the attention mechanism, you are actually using the entire slide. Uh, it's much more data efficient. Uh, so it's not as efficient as supervised learning, but much more so than the multiple instance learning. And you also can use the whole slide image level label. And so there was one issue still that was not resolved with these existing methods, and that's that the feature extraction and actually the slide level classification were separated. And the problem there is that for this feature extraction, these previous methods always used ImageNet pre-trained networks from computer vision. And you can imagine that features that are extracted by a network that was trained on cats and dogs and flowers might not be optimal for his computer for histopathology. Correct. Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe but, you know some edges or whatever those maybe the very basic ones, so like the edges and stuff like that, uh, would work, but the more complicated ones probably not. But even though that is the case, they would still get pretty decent results. But what you actually want is also learn how to optimize these features for your task, for your histopathology task. The problem is with the existing methods, you can still not train end-to-end -end because of these memory bottlenecks. And I'll just briefly skip back so to the slide. question here, is yeah. there a way of pre-trained histopathology networks? 
Like, there has been so much work done already on those histopathology images. Is there not a histopathology pre-trained network? Yeah, like not... H&E <laughs> network? Or how does there, are, there are people who have worked on... Uh, so in computer vision, there's now a bit of a hype around self-supervision. So actually networks learning from the data, the structure of the data without any annotations. And these types of methods have also been applied to histopathology. Uh, so then you get more histopathology specific features if you would use that strategy, but still not necessarily optimal for your question you're answering. For example, let's say that I train uh, self-supervised on a lot of pathology images. Uh, and yeah, then obviously it will learn the structure, right? So it will learn nuclei, it will learn lumina, it will maybe learn differences between immune cells and epithelial cells. But then if I want to classify or I identify something with patient survival, who knows whether these features are the ones that I need to do that classification. Maybe I need uh, okay, a new process. Okay, so we are in the same trap that, yeah. we, that I just fell when I thought, oh, attention is going to explain the AI. We're interpreting yeah. visually something that can be interpreted and like have no way of uh, doing anything with the things that we visually cannot interpret. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, so to actually solve this problem and allow neural networks to train end-to-end -end with whole slide images, uh, my PhD student Hans Pinkas came up with a very nice method last year. And there was just the simple insight that this, if this is your entire image, like this big image, which we color-coded here, um, you can actually classify four parts of the image separately and then later stitch that back together. And you get exactly the same mathematically exactly the same result as whether you would do this entire image at once. So in presentations, I explained it a bit like Netflix. So mm -hmm. you can actually watch the movie by downloading it part by part. And at the end, you've seen the entire movie. And luckily, you don't have to download the entire movie before you can watch it, because that would be very annoying. And this is essentially the same trick applied to computational pathology. So the network actually sees the entire image, but it only sees it part by part. But at the end, it has still seen the entire movie. And Is this like the image viewers that you only load the tiles that you uh, are actually looking at on the computer screen? Yes. It's the same concept? Yeah, it's the same concept. So you only load what you need at that point in time. And then when you move to another area, you forget the, the previous part because you don't need to need to remember it. So what we did is actually we compared this approach again to this multiple instance learning from Campanella et al, which was when we did this work was actually the, the current um, baseline. And yeah, we uh, uh, improved on it across. Uh, so for prostate cancer detection, which is also what this uh, MIL approach, multiple instance learning approach was first used for. So we uh, improve uh, on it across the board. We are also more data efficient using the streaming approach. And we have a network that generalizes much better to unseen data. So that was actually quite nice. And you can also use, again, these types of networks, which have trained end to end. You can use standard computer vision techniques to add some form of explainability. So these are the saliency maps or the rad cam approaches that some of you uh, might know. I don't know. What are the saliency maps? Yeah, so the... How is it different from attention? Yeah, so attention is something the network learns itself. So it really attributes values between zero and one on parts of the image that it thinks are important. Um, what you do here is you take an existing network and an image, and you look at the parts in the image that if you change them, change the output of the network the most. So if let's okay, say so like reverse engineering the exactly. attention exactly yes so it's a, they also call it the guided back propagations are essentially reverse engineering okay these parts of the image if I would remove them or change them then the output of my network would change so you're actually and that not... means that these are important yes yes because if the, if the areas that are unimportant you should be able to remove from the image without affecting the output of the classifier the thing is that you're then not leveraging something that the network has learned so they're a bit less accurate than attention so that's generally why people prefer attention 
but you can also use it as some form of uh, explainability. You can see here that this was a prostate cancer detection task that uh, these networks uh, focus on the, uh, the glands and not so much on the stroma surrounding it. So it does make some sense. Yeah, so what we then did was actually quite interesting. We actually com combined this streaming approach with the CLAM model. Uh, so it's called, now called S-CLAM. And then you actually have CLAM, but you can train it end-to-end. -end. So you have both the attention and you can train the feature extractor and the classification part of the network at the same time, which was very nice because we showed that if you combine these, so you com have the optimal features and you have the attention mechanism that you can vastly outperform the original CLAM method. Now, what you have to think here is that we're actually training a convolutional- And you showed that on, on the Chameleon data yeah. set, right? So it's also very data efficient because Chameleon 16 is in total 400 slides. So we're training only with 270 slides without using any of the uh, fully annot uh, the, the annotations. And we're actually getting very close to uh, models that use the, use the full annotation. So we're only 0 0.01 off in accuracy. Okay. Um, so that was actually quite a Nice result. And what you have to t keep in mind is that we're now at this. So this is at the uh, 20x magnification. So mm -hmm. we're actually training uh, ResNet 50. So a relatively modern convolutional neural network architecture end to end with images that are 50,000 times 100,000 pixels uh, without actually needing a supercomputer. So you did hack it. Yes, we did hack it a bit. Uh, <laughs> What might be nice for people wanting to explore this is that all of this is open source. Uh, so you can, it's very I'm gonna easy. I'm going to link to all those links in the show notes and in the YouTube notes as well. So yep. everybody can just go there who is at the level to do it, which I obviously am not, but and, I'm not striving to be, so that's okay. <laughs> but it's actually relatively easy to use. So you can just use your uh, standard neural network code and you need six lines of code uh, to add streaming to it, and then you can uh, essentially apply this to uh, to whole slide images. So the last thing we actually did with this, so that was actually nice uh, to do. So um, actually tried to do this for a clinically relevant task. So we actually applied it to prostate cancer survival prediction. So what we put in was a TMA core, so they're not that big, but they were still like 2,500 times 2,500 pixels, 5,000 times 5,000 pixels, something like that. And we trained end-to-end -to, -end to predict years to recurrence for patients. Um, we added concept-based explanations to this so that actually you can see the relevant areas again in the image for the net that the network uses to come up with this prediction. And then we showed that this has prognostic power in addition, uh, so with multivariate analysis, so in addition to the uh, original Gleason rate, et cetera, et cetera. This still has ad added uh, prognostic power. So we also used it for clinically relevant endpoint. And what's nice is that using this explainability layer, you can show, okay, with if you have patients which recur quickly, so within a year, you see these patterns. And we should also show them to a pathologist. So what you see here are things like creepiform growth, uh, sheets of cells, et cetera. And these are then patterns that are associated with uh, longer uh, time to recurrence. Uh, and you can see that this also visually, uh, at least for our process, made malignant. sense. Mm -hmm. So this was already kind of known. Pathologists knew that this was associated with prognosis and your network came up with the same conclusion or is there some like better shading of all the ends? Like, is there something a pathologist can learn from this? Yeah, so this, I think, is a bit too small scale to draw definite conclusions. What we see is a bit of a confirmation. So these are, if you look at Gleason grading and prostate cancer, uh, we know that, uh, for for example, cribriform growth is now classified as a pattern four, whereas uh, historically it was could be both three or four. And actually now there's a bit of a movement within the Europathologist community that maybe creepiform growth should be noted separately as a bad prognostic factor. And that is something that we see confirmed in these, these results. So in addition to 
Gleason 4 patterns, Cribiform growth is a separate prognostic in, er, indicator for bad prognosis. So um, it looks like that pathologists can also use it to etch, at least guide discovery of prognostically relevant patterns. Uh, I'm a bit hesitant to really say that they would, uh, and at this stage, would learn uh, a lot from it because it, it's more that it confirms their intuitions than that we show them really something completely new. But of, obviously, that's something that we can that we hope to do in the near future. How do I say it? Like in the same way, would it be possible to maybe at some point translate the molecular prediction into something visually recognizable? Yes, so that's something we're now looking at in several projects. Also, other groups have, for example, already uh, done, for example, ERPR prediction for morphology for breast cancer, and that works surprisingly well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard about IHC prediction from H&E. Yeah, so also groups have done that. I think in some cases that you can actually do that. Uh, for example, where I don't believe that would work is if I think you can, for example, learn the morphological patterns of lymphocytes, right? So, for example, predicting a CD3 stain from uh, H&E, I think, will still mostly be feasible. Not perfect, but feasible. But, for example, then doing a, a CD8 uh, prediction relative to the non-CD8 CD3 positive cells, I think that's impossible. This information is simply not in the morphology. Uh, so you have to be a bit careful... Uh, with the application there, I guess. Okay. So it's definitely not one size fits all. I don't think so, but I think there is a surprising amount of use cases that you get that. Yeah, this would I, I would say as well that there is a limitation because uh, there is a reason why these are molecular markers. You don't see those molecules, but there's also like a wide spectrum of visual features that we're not really focusing on, but still can be interpreted. Whether it's possible to teach it to a person, I don't know, uh, but probably it's possible to extract it from the image in yeah, so, computational pathology. Yeah, so from my own group, we've done, for example, MIC translocation prediction for diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. And that goes surprisingly well. So you really are at like 80% accuracy. So there is some morphological substrate of a MIG translocation in the morphology of the lymphoma. But we're still working on how to make that interpretable such that you can actually say something meaningful about what it is in the morphology uh, that allows the network to predict that. And are you anywhere close to finding it or it's going to be trial and error? That, that's also why I say that these attention mechanisms are not perfect. So we, we are using attention for this. So we know like the spatial regions that are important, but what is now exactly important within those regions? Is it like maybe it's like the, the nuclei are on average 5% uh, larger than in the other yeah. cases? Um, it, it's currently visually not... So if we would show it blind to a pathologist, I don't think they can see the difference. You would show it to, you know, a very, not even blind, educated pathologist who would... Well, if you showed this to me and told me exactly where, what am I supposed to look for? Maybe in the first slide I would know it, but in the third, like, I would be completely lost. Exactly. So this uh, there is, is so... a limitation to our visual cognition, right? It's not a question, is it there or not? It's, is it possible to consistently recognize it in the images? Can a human being do that? And I can say, I probably can't. I barely can like do the um, percentage estimates that, you know, pathologists are routinely asked to do. And uh, these are correlated to survival and the uh, Kaplan-Meier curves are being based on this. I'm like, don't use mine because that's not going to be accurate. No, that, that's a, it's, it's indeed visually being able to visually recognize it at all, but it's also often a quantification task along large areas, right? So also these percentages... Yeah, you can do it on 10 high-powered fields, but yeah, you cannot do it across the entire slide, at least not reliably. 
So it could also be that it's something that you can visually extract, but it's not, but not reproducible enough to be useful. Yeah, is part of of what flows into the whole uh, result of of the network. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, there's a lot. Uh... A lot to it. <laughs> Thanks so much for explaining this. So now, another on another note, how are these um, approaches making it into the clinic? Is your company working on incorporating this? Because obviously, in the research environment in academia, you can uh, play, you can do whatever, gather a lot of data. But how do those? Uh, approaches get translated because you already you know you have such great approaches that almost match the annotations what i'm seeing everybody is still doing annotations because that's like the easiest that's pathologist uh, pathologist is the ground truth whether it's a good one or not but it is a human trained um how yeah, does this get translated yeah, I think right now for these approaches, it's a bit of a battle between. So I think the accuracy and the the, the like the performance is nearly there. And I think like within within this year, probably you will have methods that are as good as working with fully supervised, uh, fully annotated slides. And then probably you need still more data with the weekly supervised methods than with the fully supervised. But I think you. Performance-wise, you can get close enough. Um, I think then there is a second question on uh, what we indeed call explainability and acceptance by uh, clinicians, pathologists. Um, for example, Panda Challenge, which was a challenge on prostate cancer grading. We ourselves developed an algorithm that was based on mostly on an fully supervised annotations. And that worked really well. And the advantage is that you can also visually show the predictions for the individual glands to a pathologist. So it has some form of interpretability. But within that challenge, actually the best algorithms didn't do this at all. They just used a weekly supervised approach where they only used the slide level labels. The question is, will pathologists accept an algorithm where a slide goes in and a Gleason grade or whatever prognostic marker for the patient comes out without any interpretable stage, right? I guess at, the, at this point, it's the answer is no. Yeah, exactly. So the re I think the main reason why not all the companies are switching to these weekly supervised methods is that it's the acceptance in the clinic of fully supervised methods at this moment is higher. So what we have to solve as computational pathologists, so to say, is this explainability part. So how can we give pathologists insight into what these weekly supervised methods are doing and increase the trustworthiness such that they are accepted uh, in clinical use, but also in the toxicological pathology community, I think you would have the same questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Definitely. So um, we mentioned a couple of surrogates, like the attention, if it matches what uh, is in the morphology. And I think there is enough applications where it does uh, but also plenty of applications where we don't know or like don't want to make this forced interpretation so yeah a lot of exploration still yeah, so yeah and it's i think it's also a discussion that that we need to have like for example here so i you show attention maps do you think this is acceptable what would you like to see do you need so in some projects we're now looking at like report generation really like generating text uh, that describes what an algorithm is seeing. A bit the I'm not sure for the people who watch this podcast if they've seen the the DALI network that was developed by OpenAI recently, where you provide a, a string of text and then it generates an artwork for you. Highly recommend people looking that up. I haven't, but I'm gonna link to this uh, to information about it in the show notes as well. Yeah, so I think generally for, for me, what I think the highest, the holy grail of explainability would be is if a neural network would just write down in common language that everybody doing. can understand what it's seeing. And uh -huh. I think we'll need some time to get there. But if you look at what the big tech companies are now doing with natural language processing, I think we're 
getting quite close to having these techniques. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks so much for explaining this. There is a lot of um, things to explore still and the field stays interesting. So there is uh, still an exponential growth of solutions, trying to hack it, trying to get around the um, logistical and technical limitations. So um, it definitely stays cool. Thanks so much, Gerard. You're welcome. And then I'll save the unsupervised learning for next time. Yes, we're going to meet again and then again to talk about the company. That sounds good. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're still watching, so you're great and definitely interested in digital pathology and tissue image analysis. So be sure to subscribe, click the bell below and be notified every time I release a new video. And I talk to you in the next episode. I'm gonna go get